This video is part of a series. If you haven't watched part one, I would urge you to do so now. Link is in the description. When we last left off, it was Serpico's first major duel with Guts near the mountainside, and this is the first real taste of Serpico's analytical mind when it comes to battle. We saw glimpses of this sprinkled out throughout the arc, but this time, we're seeing a much more emotionally charged Serpico, and seeing how his mind works in this scenario is an interesting one, especially since both Guts and Serpico have different stakes in the fight. Serpico didn't need to stop Guts. Farni even said not to let personal bias get in the way of duty, but for Serpico, his whole identity revolves around Farni. We even see his monologue for fighting in the first place is, you're a bit too distressing for Miss Farni, you will disappear. Whereas for Guts, he's just trying to get back to Casca, whom he left with Isidro at this point in time. This is an interesting dynamic, as the two have similar goals, but the relationship with both Farni to Serbico and Casca to Guts manifests in different ways. Guts is fighting to return to Casca to keep her safe. She completes Guts in a way that not only is she the one he loves, but is also one of the remaining symbols of a band he once cared for, along with my boy Ricker, of course. Guts is very much still his own person with his own goals and conflictions as these manifest in the Beast of Darkness but he's changed his whole mindset to be a protector. Serpico's goal is revenge for Farni. Although not sporting a hateful demeanor like Guts was as the Black Swordsman, it's a similar concept to what Guts once acted like. Serpico very much feels like a manifestation of Farni's emotions and is almost like a blank slate for her to project this onto, or so it would seem at first. He really should be with Farni right now, I mean Jesus Christ, she's literally fending off evil possessed heretics. But Serpico is operating at the mercy of Farni's will. What matters to him only in this moment is that Guts is causing her emotional distress, and so he will finish Guts off. Despite the seriousness of the fight, Miura keeps some levity for Serpico, which matches his carefree nature which we've seen since his introduction. I really like the tonal shift of Serbico looking all brooding and ready for a duel, only for Guts to be no nonsense as usual and begins firing a volley of arrows, much to Serbico's dismay. This next page has a ton of detail to go through, which highlights how Serbico acts and thinks in battle. This is mainly due to how Miura portrays the quick successions of actions that Guts is performing and how Serbico reacts to such speed. Guts throws one of the explosives he receives from Rico after he fires the arrows. We can follow from the panels that Guts did this almost immediately after the previous action. Serbico barely had time to react to this, nor did he have any idea what the explosives looked like, as he would have only had a quick glimpse, nor what they could do. The second detail is a really great touch by Miura, which highlights not only Guts' reactionary time through visuals, which we've seen many times before, but also Serbico's. Notice how when Guts is walking through the smoke caused by the explosives, there is a little glint of Serpico's sword he notices almost immediately and dodges accordingly. The glint is a nice detail which some may miss on a first read, but what we really should be paying attention to is how Serpico not only survived, but managed to draw his sword and act accordingly. Not only would have Serpico been disorientated from the explosive, but it takes one of extreme acrobatic skill to be able to grip and climb back up on such a narrow platform. We saw Serbico's impressive draw speed earlier in the arc, but it's cool to see this first demonstration of how acrobatic he is. It reminds me of Golden Age Griffith a tad. It's a small detail, but notice how Serbico's eyes are widened once he reorientates himself and starts fighting against Guts. It's a nice visual cue by Miura that Serbico is now taking the fight seriously. But what we see next when we return to the fight is why Serbico is a real monster. It's not because of his impressive fighting prowess, nor is it how he analyzes his environment, though this plays a big part into it. It's how he analyzes his opponents. Serbico explains that he chose this area because the narrow cliffside prevents Guts from wielding the Dragon Slayer, but that's only part of the picture. The environment wasn't chosen on the basis of Guts wielding such a huge sword alone. Serbico has analysed Guts' entire fighting style, and even personality up to this point, and as he puts it himself, position, physique, technique, equipment, all of them work against you in this place. 
Serpico is someone who can take one look at an individual and suss out what kind of person they are, and the fact he can apply this to battle makes him a scary foe. Think of how little he has actually seen Guts at this point, but he has already figured out how Guts fights in battle and strategized an effective battle plan which even keeps the famed Black Swordsman on his toes. However, this is what makes Serpico truly cunning and calculated. Notice how Serpico went on his own. This works hand in hand with Serpico being both an emotional and analytical fighter. We know he went alone due to his emotional attachment to Farney and how he burdens himself with her will, and this will be expanded upon in their backstory in the next arc, but this was also a calculated decision based on what Guts instills in his enemies, fear. One of Guts' biggest quirks within the battlefield is how he's seen as inhuman. Once you see this mammoth of a man cut down hundreds of foes, you've given up before you've even fought. But Serpico knows this, and that is what makes him not only really interesting, but also terrifying. Because what kind of person does Serpico have to be to understand a perceived monster like Guts? Serpico says it best himself. Confronting you with sheer numbers is the height of folly. Once you cut down 10 men with that sword, the tide of the battle turns. Allies inflicted with fear are worse than enemies. Serpico's internal monologue provides detail about all aspects of the environment that even the reader would have trouble picking up on. From the sun in Guts' eyes, the precarious footing, Guts' large physique and equipment, and even Guts' good hand against the rock wall, preventing him to draw it at all in top capacity, not like he could anyway. And as Serpico puts it, all of these limit you. Guts' observations of Serpico's fighting prowess is crucial for two main reasons. The first is that we're seeing another character analyse Serpico's fighting style from the other end, especially this being Guts, and this being the first formidable human opponent he's faced since, like, the Golden Age. Guts realises Serpico's speed, even commenting on how he's not giving him a chance to draw, and that it's not just strategy. Serpico is a naturally talented swordsman. The second reason is kind of a cheat because it ties directly into the first, because the character being Guts is why this is crucial. Think of what Guts has faced up to this point, countless apostles over the last two years as the Black Swordsman, and Guts has Serpico's tougher than the pseudo apostle he'd literally just fought. I really enjoy this because it helps enrich the wider world of Berserk itself and how humanity is still a huge driving force and dangerous in this world. After the events of the Golden Age, the shift in narrative switched to Guts taking on inhuman opponents, with their strength being reflected through their demonic powers. Serpico helps represent a turning point that the world of Berserk still has formidable human opponents in a post-Golden Age world, and that there are many like Serpico out there which are monsters just like Guts, especially when magic comes into play. Look at Guts' expression here. He's sweating profusely, and his remaining eyes displaying that of intense concentration for the current battle, and one of worry and urgency. He even says himself, I don't have time to screw around here, and Serpico uses this to his advantage, attempting to provoke Guts by saying, those girls should be in custody by now. An interesting detail is the battle damage that Guts takes through Serpico's quick movement throughout the fight, such as on his neck after Serpico unleashes his flurry here, and on his arm after Serpico distracts Guts by saying Casca should be in custody around now. Serpico internally monologues that the statement was a lie, and that he won't be able to win if he fights fairly. This is a similar mantra that a lot of Berserk fights operate off. There are no fair fights in this world, you either live or you die. Honour isn't something that Guts cares about in his fights. There are so many examples of this throughout the series, holding Teresa hostage in the Black Swordsman, biting Griffith's rapier in their first door in the Golden Age, and so many more. And seeing Serpico follow a similar code, based on his experiences of how cruel the world could be, just like Guts, is interesting to see and shows similarities between the two. But then, we see a flay to flaw of Serpico's. He operates too logically, despite his cunning nature. He has an internal logic of how things should be, which allows Guts to get the upper hand. Guts grabs Serpico's blade barehanded, with extreme quick reflexes, which shocks Serpico as he finds it absurd, as why can he just pull back the sword and damage Guts' good hand? I adore this next moment, with Guts calmly explaining to Serpico, with a bit of brawn and reflexes, that it's not absurd at all, and promptly shatters his sword. 
Serpico's reaction here is glorious. The shading the urine culprit and how wide he looks paints a picture that Serpico's calm demeanour, which operates on logic, has been destroyed, and in this moment, he is terrified. Despite this, Serpico displays an absolute power move, as Guts prepares to unleash a volley of arrows to an off-guard Serpico. Serpico acrobatically makes his way around Guts, grabs one of his explosives, and detonates it as a means to escape. The ending to this fight is a wonderful showcase of Miura demonstrating Serpico's skills both visually and narratively. I love the motion incorporated of how quick Serpico was in planning his escape, the speed line showing that Serpico performed his action so quickly that even Guts only realised what was happening at the last moment, as the explosive was heading right for him. The narrative victory is how quick Serpico adapts to situations on the fly. Serpico only saw Guts use these explosives once, and he was immediately able to suss out that stealing one would be a means of escape. Even Guts acknowledges this and ends with the following. Bastard's cunning, like a fox. This next moment with Serpico is key. I really am becoming more serious than my ordinary style. This is going to become more clear when we cover Serpico's and Farney's backstory, but for now, think about why Serpico is acting this way. Guts is eliciting emotions in Farney that Serpico hasn't seen before. As someone who can read people as well as Serpico can, and how much he cares for Farney in general, he's seeing change in Farney he didn't think was possible. Speaking of Farney, we get more hints of their relationship after Farney is ordered to return home, only herself and not for Holy Iron Chain Knights, much to her dismay, and she immediately believes that Serbko was the one who snitched on her to her father to influence the Order. The power dynamic here is insane, and it just makes the reader long for the explanation of these two. We've seen how Serbko acts on his own, he's cunning and intelligent, and even gave someone like Guts a hard time. But look how he acts with Farney. He's oddly silent throughout this whole exchange. Gone is the cocky individual we saw in his introduction with Azan, and subservient to her will. I love the detail of his eyes widening after Farney says, I am your master. You have sworn your sword to me. It's just a further visual confirmation of Serbico's relationship to her. There are no intense emotions in those eyes, just complete subserviency to his master. Farney then says to Serbico, Do you hate me? With which Serbico responds, to talk of hate, before she interrupts him. Let's put a pin in this for now, as this exchange will become more clear when we cover their backstory at the beginning of the next arc. Serbico then takes a bit of a backseat until right near the very end of the arc, when he saves Farney from falling after the chaos from the incarnation ceremony being well underway. One moment I feel doesn't get enough attention in Serbico's case is when Guts tells Farney to stop praying, as if you're praying, your hands are closed and you cannot act. In this scenario, picking up the torch to ward off the spectres at hand. Remember what I said previously about Serbico's comment? I really am becoming more serious, more so than my ordinary style. Well, the same mantra manifests here, but differently. Before Serbico saw change in Farney, that Guts was challenging her ideologies and indoctrination to the Holy See, that no one in her immediate environment did before. Because Farney saw this change as a negative and horrifying thing, Serbico tried to stamp out Guts as a result. But look at the exact moment when Serbico looks back at Farney. When she begins to grasp the torch, fire has different meanings to both Farney and Serbico. For Farney, it was a sign of comfort and belonging in the dark, miserable world that the Berserk universe is, almost like she was a slave to it. But for Serbico, fire represents the pure cruelty of the world. He finds no comfort in it, nor a sense of belonging. It's what killed his mother after all, but this analogy is hierarchical in a sense. As Farni is a slave to the flames, Serbico is a slave to Farni. And if she is rejecting prayer and forging her own path with the fire, then it means that Serbico will start becoming more independent for himself. We end conviction with Serbico going off with Farni to follow Guts. I do enjoy his casual exchange with Azan. Back to his carefree roots we saw right at the beginning of Lost Children because despite the horrors of the incarnation ceremony which just occurred, Farney has chosen her own path and Serbico will still follow her to the ends of the earth. This development in Farney also means Serbico can start growing on his own, which I will cover in the next and final part, where we cover the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc, starting off on a banger on Serbico's and Farney's backstory, Serbico's rise in that arc in general, 
and his eventual stagnation after Vratanus. Thanks for watching.